Thank you so much. So now we've got almost a full half hour for discussion. Um, do we have any questions to start off? Uh, let me, I'll collect three or four questions and then we'll go back for a second round. Yes, the woman in the back. Um, good afternoon. Um, I just want to thank all the presenters. It was really interesting. My question is related to the last presentation. I realize this question is not you know, related to your topic, but it's something I'm more curious about. But reflecting on kind of state business relationships that we've heard a lot about and how Rwanda does constantly well on the doing business surveys, but I'm not sure how that reflects you know, in terms of the firms you've mentioned, in terms of the exporting. So if you could just give us some insights in that, like the, the kind of the impact of state business relations on Rwandan firms. Actually, let me ask you to introduce yourself as well. Sorry, sorry. sorry. My name is Radha, <laughs> and I'm uh, with the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Nairobi with uh, Professor Dorothy McCormick. Thank you. OK, the woman in the front. Yes, hi, uh, Lindsay Whitfield, Ross Gilder University, Denmark. I have a few questions um, for the Rwanda presentation and a comment about the apparel one. Um, I don't, I'm not that familiar with the learning to export um, project and this is my first panel so maybe I'm missing something but I just thought maybe it would be useful to reiterate in the project, you know, why is exporting important? And from the literature I know it's usually to access higher profits because of the, the payment in those markets to export more um, and to build technological capabilities. And in that sense I would think that you would have differentiated export markets and that would have really in a way made some of these points not important because you wouldn't have been looking to learn through exporting to to regional markets if they don't have those kind of characteristics. The other is that when you say the learning by exporting literature, are you including global value chain literature? Because I know that economists don't always talk to that literature and actually it would have solved a lot, it would bring up a lot of um, uh, these issues. I think, you know, how do you learn in, in technological upgrading and how export markets force that on you, um, and I don't see any of that coming. Coming, I'm just wondering if, if that's included when you talk about what the literature says. Um, and then lastly, on the supply constraint, I think this is really important and really important for, for African countries. The work I've done in Ghana on horticultural export market and other agro-based, and the supply side is actually the most important constraint in, in accessing, because if you cannot deliver, and again, this is the global value chain literature would tell you, if you can't deliver a consistent quality and high volume uh, amount of products, then you can't participate in, in export markets. And the issue on supply is that most African countries have smallholder-based production. So you have issues of how do you increase productivity of smallholders, how do you you do collective action problems if they're going to export directly. Then you have issues of outgrower screens, you have issues of contract enforcement, and, and the not talked about but very important problem of land tenure institutions and access. These are the fundamental problems constraining agriculture and agro-processing, and they really do matter for export markets as well. And I think this is important because if you take the literature of Carlotta Perez, it says, actually agriculture is becoming decommoditized and there are high rents to be accessed in these markets. And African countries really have to uh, address these, these issues. So to me, it's not a su surprise that the, the constraint is on the supply side in agriculture. Um, and at risk of actually taking up more time, I just wanted to raise a quick point. I think the apparel industry is very interesting, Dorothy, but I was surprised that you didn't give more history to what was going on, because I think it's important to realize that quotas and preferential market access has, has shaped global apparel markets since their very beginning, and they've also driven the dispersion of productive capabilities across countries, from Japan to East Asia to Southeast Asia, um, with you know the voluntary export restraints that the US put, MFA was a product of Europe, restricting, and that was what resulted in Bangladesh and Mauritius gaining those capacities. And then AGOA was what allowed Lesotho and Kenya to, to, have, um, to have foreign investment as well. So I mean, this, this, mar this global value chain, this market has always been shaped 
by quotas and preferential market access. And that's important because whether or not when you get this FDI hopping, the, the important thing is whether or not that leads to developing the domestic firms, right? And that's what Bangladesh and that's what Mauritius did. That's what Lesotho hasn't done. And you didn't mention the labor unrest in Lesotho, which is, I think, what also drove away some foreign direct investment. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yes, the woman in the front. Thank you uh, for the excellent presentation, three of you. Uh, I'm Zhu Lin from Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, Beijing. And uh, the question to first speaker, you're talking about uh, overseas uh, African, uh, because I cannot use these words, what is a dia, diaspora. Uh, that uh, you took Africa as a whole, uh, if uh, for your studied country is uh, 19, uh, how large is the group for each country? If it's uh, too small of the numbers, uh, what kind of impact of their uh, export, exporting activity uh, exercised on the country? Because uh, uh, in China, there's a huge number among the mainland, the Taiwanese and the Hong Kongese, also South Asian. So I'd like to know that the numbers for the country. And for the second speaker, now I got your answer from here. You talk about that African country facing all the competition from China on all the markets. Uh, the first question, except those uh, uh, case-studied countries, what happened with the other country that uh, they are not existing uh, in the uh, government uh, uh, market? Uh, and uh, for those uh, surviving, what is their strategy for the future competition? You said that is a win-win but still is uh, for the uh, closing market, still can be divided for the low level or high quality different markets. So could you tell a little bit in, in which uh, sub-market has African countries uh, competitive advantage? Thank okay, you. thank you. And we just have one final question in the front here, and then we'll move on to responses from the speakers. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, very big thanks to all presenters for very well articulated presentation. Uh, my question goes to the first presenter uh, on the issue of diaspora investment. And uh, it relates to uh, one of the ways in which you alluded to uh, investments from diaspora was through remittances. I'm wondering whether in your data set there was a differentiation between uh, immigrants who have returned to the country vis-a-vis uh, -vis those who are just sending money while living abroad. And in my view, the two would be very different because of the management. Uh, my interaction in Ethiopia is that uh, the people who have returned from abroad and are carrying out investment, uh, I think they have better connections to the market. But when you are just sending funds, management and control is by the locals. And I tend to imagine that in terms of them exporting and performing would not be significantly different. So, was there any differentiation in terms of how the diaspora was acting in the investment and in decision making for the local farms? Thank you. Thank you. Um, why don't we have responses from the speakers in, in order of speaking? <laughs> so, Amadou? Yeah. I'll say, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for, for the questions. Uh, regarding the first one, treating Africa as a whole, you're right that uh, Africa consists of uh, many countries that are different. 
But here the idea was really focusing on whether there's a difference uh, when the firms belong to a diaspora member. Uh, so uh, it's true that we only control for country specifics uh, using dummy variables. We didn't look into country differences. And just to answer also your question, it's about 5% uh, of the total sample, which is pretty low. And in some countries like uh, Uganda, Kenya, or Ethiopia, you have about 15%. So uh, this gives you the percentage. And in terms of impact on the economy, the whole idea is much more can be done. Uh, I cannot tell you now what is the impact on the economy, but the idea is if they can contribute to increasing the exports of their uh, home countries, then government have an option to look into that possibility. So this would be the main message uh, from, from the paper. But I guess it's far less than the contribution of country of uh, the diaspora in China, Taiwan, uh, or India, for example. Uh, for the second question, unfortunately, we don't have additional information on the diaspora. As I said, it was basically one question whether it was a diaspora investment or not. But what we do have, and we are not looking at here in the paper, is the share of uh, this diaspora investor in, in the, the total investment. But uh, uh, it's true that we are not referring to that here. So, but uh, you, you're right that the quality matter, like characteristics of the diaspora matter a lot. All right, um, I think there were two main questions for, for the apparel study. And uh, one, uh, Lindsay, thank you for uh, making the point, which is very true. History is important. And I think I cut out some of it because I was trying to get to the main findings and so on, but, but you're, you're absolutely right that the whole history of the uh, clothing industry, the global clothing industry has, was ruled by the MFA and its predecessors over, over a long period of time, and it did shape the industry. Um, and one can see also, even if you go beyond that global level to the individual countries, that say a country like Mauritius has a much longer history uh, of export clothing production than uh, some of the others where, say, Kenya had an import substitution industry which collapsed with liberalization, and then some things came back and foreign investment came in. So the history of each of the countries really does play itself out in, in this uh, industry, and it, ma it makes a big difference. Um, so I think that, that in, in, there's a little bit more of it in the paper, but it, you're encouraging me to uh, maybe make it still stronger as I uh, work on the revision. Um, then the question that, uh, about um, other countries and are they not in apparel. Um, the, we used basically the Comtrade data because we were interested in export clothing production. And so we identified, we used the Comtrade data and then we used what we knew of the countries to identify the five major exporters. And those were the ones that I was reporting. There are others who have much lower levels of exports and others who have a clothing industry which is totally domestic or, or regional. So the, the five that we have reported are the main exporters into global markets. Um, one of the things, though, that we, we think we need to study more to understand where the industry might be going uh, are those who are producing for regional markets. An interesting thing that we discovered, um, we didn't expect when we started out that the Africa market would be <coughs> important because all of these were, we thought, exporting either to Europe or the U.S. But we found that some of them, in their efforts to diversify, or from the supply side, firms from South Africa were moving into, for example, Lesotho and Swaziland and exporting back into South Africa. And Mauritius was exporting into South Africa. And some were exporting into other countries. So the African market 
it seems, is growing in importance for these clothing producers. And we think we need to, because we focused on the exporters, the, the global exporters, we tended to find our population among them. But we, we know from Kenya and from some other work, for example, that Paul Kamau has done, that there are some who are uh, exporting into regional markets and who are doing quite well at it. So we think that this is another area of research that we need to, to get into. What, what are those firms doing who are exporting into African markets? And is there a possibility of, of more growth there, even if the global markets be, uh, remain a bit unstable? Um, I think that's what I have. Super. Yeah, let, let, let me start with a question on state business relations in Rwanda. And um, so you're right, Rwanda has done very well on doing business. And like John Page was saying earlier, it doesn't, it doesn't really have any relationship with how good state business, relation, um, state business relations go in terms of large companies and stuff like that. A couple of, a couple of thoughts on that. One, one is that um, it's a very small sector, right? So if, if we're talking about manufacturing and exporting, uh, there are just 50 firms in the country that manufacture, and out of those, maybe 22 that actually export. And um, uh, like Mans was telling me earlier, it's very idiosyncratic. All these companies have their own little problems. So talking about state business relationships on average doesn't really make sense, because all these little companies have different issues. They're exporting to different places. So it almost has to be a one-on-one -on -one relationship for it to make any sense. Um, the second point is that, yes, uh, state business relationships are not very structured at this point in time. There are some efforts in place to make that happen. So, for example, there's um, um, the, the IDB is engaging very heavily now with exporters to see if they can link them. The IDB is the Rwanda Development Board, so it's like the investment promotion agency, but also the export promotion agency. And they have a number of projects now to see if they can actually link um, manufacturers and exporters to um, buyers in neighboring countries, so in DRC and in Burundi, because the big problem is that people don't really know, um, uh, the, the, the people that are running these companies don't really know the markets in those countries and how to export there, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, there are other structures in place um, to, to sort of get business around the same table as, um, as government. The third point is that I think, to be honest, um, services is more important for the Rwandan government at this time. At least they perceive service companies to be more important. So if, if we're talking about banks, if we're talking about telecom companies, if we're talking about um, uh, ICT, I think there there's much more engagement and the government is much more responsive, if you like, to the needs and demands of, uh, of the private sector than in the, man uh, than in the manufacturing sector. I think... Um, some parts of government, government have given up a bit because like you saw, it's been flat for the past 30 years. The, the, all of these projects have been implemented, executed, et cetera, and at the end of the day, it's still flat. Okay. So I, I think that's what I would say on, um, on state business relationships. I don't know if it really answers your question or not. Um, on, on the issue of uh, learning with neighboring countries uh, that you were raising earlier, um, I think I think the, the countries next to Rwanda, uh, DRC, Burundi in particular, and the broader EAC region, is really where the future of the country lies, where the exports lies, and that, that is what is gonna drive growth in Rwanda's manufacturing sector. It's not exports to Europe or exports to, um, to other countries. I don't know what the literature says on it, um, but, but in, this, in this case, I think, I mean, in Rwanda's case, learning is gonna happen from exporting to these neighboring markets, not elsewhere simply because Rwanda is not competitive on other markets. Um, in terms of supply chains and global supply chains, I guess my one point is that what makes a difference in terms of productivity for firms in Rwanda and how well they do is how good their supply chains are. And if you, if you look at the performance of companies, you'll find there's one very striking feature, which is that um, companies that are owned by larger groups and especially groups that are highly diversified and operational in the region do much, much better than other firms. 
let me give you, for example, let me give you the example of Bakresa. So Bakresa is a Tanzanian mega company, um, and they also do wheat flour, and they have a wheat flour processor in uh, Rwanda. Now, what happens is they get their wheat, the wheat they process in uh, Rwanda is imported from Australia. They have their own port terminal. So the boat comes, sits in the port terminal of Bakresa. Bak Bakresa has its own transport fleet of trucks and whatever. So they, they, take the, they, they take the wheat into their truck, bring it to Rwanda where it's processed, and it's put into the packages that their firm makes in, uh, in Dar es Salaam. Now, how can a small company compete against that? It's impossible because there is no packaging industry in Rwanda. Um, transport costs are ridiculously high and transporters charge huge premiums. So companies that have these supplied networks in place can do much, much better. And that's why, for me, I think the future of manufacturing in countries like that, that are landlocked, is going to be through the vector of large groups, not through um, small individual uh, manufacturing firms that have been there for 20 years and that maybe have an output of four or five, six, ten million dollars, but ultimately are too small <coughs> to overcome the constraints they, um, they face. I don't know if that provides some context maybe to, to what I was saying. Okay, thank you. Um, we have just a few more minutes, so if there are any more, any final follow-up <coughs> questions or quick comments, quick questions, please. Okay, the, in the middle of the room here. Hello, I'm Lotta from the University of Witzwater's Rand. Uh, my question is um, to Dorothy McCormick. Um, it was a very interesting presentation. I was particularly interested in the differences in um, the stability of the sectors across the countries and in their product mix, so some producing basic, others more advanced products. I would be interested in hearing your insights on um, labor, in particular labor costs as a race to the bottom and labor is the predominant cost in clothing, and whether there's any differences in, across the countries, and whether there's been any change in the way employment is structured, has there been an increase in outsourcing, um, use of informal labor, etc., cetera, um, across the countries. Is this something that is similar? Is this the way they all compete? Or are you, are you noticing differences across the different countries? Thank you. Just one more final question. I think there was uh, someone just behind you. Thank you. Uh, Imgard Nübler from the ILO in Geneva. <clears throat> I also have a question to Dorothy. Um, you mentioned the, the important fact that about half of the technically skilled uh, workers were expatriates. Uh, and I would like to know a little bit more about that. First of all, is it this, uh, about the same share across countries? Um, is there a difference in ownership? Can we say that multinational enterprises would have a different share of, of uh, expatriates than domestically owned firms? Um, can we say something about the destiny? Uh, you know, whether it makes a difference uh, whether they export to the US or uh, into African countries. Uh, so I would like to understand a little bit more what is it that, you know, first of all, there is such a high share of uh, um, expatriates in this area, and also is the reason that um, the high standards um, they have the companies have to meet, or is it that um, there are not, there is no training for, uh, for domestically, uh, for domestic workers in these uh, technical skills? Thank you. Thank you. So we just have five more minutes, less than five more minutes till the end of the session. So I'll just ask the panelists to respond briefly and um, if they have any closing comments. Two of the questions, I think, were directed to me, so let me answer those, and then uh, we can, uh, others can pick up. Um, the issue of labor and uh, labor costs and outsourcing, um, we, we didn't explicitly study labor, so I don't have a lot of detail on this, but one thing we do know is that, for example, Mauritius does have higher wages. They're, they're at a different level of development, and they have a higher standard. And what they have been doing, because they don't get enough local labor, uh, is they have been, in some of the firms, import labor from Bangladesh. 
So it's the only country where the expatriate labor is actually machine operators. In all the other countries, the expatriate labor are technical workers with skills. But in, in uh, Mauritius, they do have uh, expatriate uh, machinists. Um, they're not outsourcing, as far as we know, uh, the labor from the factories we visit and the things we see, the workers are typical in-factory workers. Um, and most of those, uh, again, I, I, we have some data which we haven't analyzed fully on wage rates, so I can't really speak to that very well. Um, on the technical skills issue in the expatriates, um, the, the the, ver the percentages vary. Um, in uh, Mauritius is the only one that reports little or no expatriate technical workers. In the other countries, it goes from a high of 92% of the technical workers being expatriate in Lesotho, 83 in Swaziland, sorry, 92% in Swaziland, 83% in Lesotho, 62% in Madagascar, and 53% in Kenya. So it's over half, between a half and 100% um, across the board, which is one of the reasons why we were so concerned about it. Um, if we remember that across the board, foreign ownership is 63%, um, even some of these, it's not only uh, the foreign firms that are uh, using expatriate technical workers, but typically it is. You have a Chinese firm, for example, and they bring the technical workers from China. Or you have an Indian firm and they bring technical workers from India. Uh, so, and they say to us when we ask them, because in some cases we actually asked about this when we went back and did case studies, we asked people, and they said that, that they, the people of the country don't have those skills, that there aren't adequate training programs. So one of the things that we are doing uh, now is we are working with the Export Processing Zones Authority uh, and the Ministry of Trade in Kenya to, to, who have the idea of setting up a high-level technical training institute for the region um, in Kenya uh, to see if that kind of a thing would be feasible and would be helpful for not only Kenya but for the other countries in the region. So we're in the process of, of working on that with those, those people. So maybe we'll have some more answers uh, later on. So I think those were my questions. Okay, uh, thank you. Did the other speakers have any? I you know the questions were mainly for Dorothy, this last set. Uh, no okay, um, so I urge you all to download and read these papers. They're very interesting. Um, and I know there are a few more questions from the audience, but I invite you to talk with the speakers during the, the coffee break now. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.